He's Mike Golick Jr. I'm Jason Fitz, and we are Golick and Fitz. I never get tired of saying that. I just feel like, you know, we, we're in, in spirit of WrestleMania this weekend, Mike. We're like a tag team, buddy. Golick and Fitz, we're coming back at you as we do every single day from 3.30-ish to 4-ish right here. No, you're, you're out on my, my, my intro. You don't like this, Mike? You're making the stinky fart face, my friend. Yeah, no, it's the perfect time for me to post that link to Twitter with not a wrestling tag team because we would get destroyed with you. Unless I could use you as a weapon, we'd probably be in a lot of trouble. You are underselling my ability in an 80s tag team. See, because you're forgetting that one of my great life moments could have been, like if I could redo my whole life, I would have been the new Jimmy Mouth of the South Heart. Like I could have been the trash talker. I could have been the guy that was out there sort of getting everybody fired up. I'll work the crowd. I'll distract our opponent. You do all the beef work. That's, that's the way it's supposed to work, right? Jason, you are every backup quarterback I ever played with in my entire life, which is shout from behind the wall of beef at the bar and then let us throw the guy out after, which usually worked out pretty well for the quarterback, to be honest. So it's a heady play. Um, by the way, I mean, I think every music guy ever has been that guy. Like if I go into a bar, like I just once, I want you and I to go into a bar with a bunch of like your biggest buddies. Oh, you think I'm insufferable now. Just wait and see where it goes. Speaking of your buddies, we like to start every day with an interesting wellness check-in conversation. So we're going to do a little bit of fun here. And you guys, by the way, can uh, give us your answers on this if you ever, uh, if you want to chime in on Twitter. Like, I would like to see what people have to say about this. We're going to do a little bit of quarantine house building, okay? So here's the way it works, Mike. Uh, you're going to pick one person that works at ESPN. You're going to pick one musician and you're going to pick one athlete. And these are people that you want to be quarantined with. You can live in one house together. We're going to give you like a big brother sort of house. You're living 24 seven with these three people, men or women, doesn't matter. One ESPN person, one musician, one athlete, build your quarantine house for us, Mike. All right. So I'm going to start off with the ESPN person and all this one. And I'm going to go see a lot of people would be a little shocked by this. I'm going to go with Stu Gatz. Now, a lot of people think irresponsible, guy who's going to run his mouth, maybe after a while try and steal money out of your wallet, but I know he's going to have alcohol with him wherever he goes in a lot of this one. I know he's going to entertain the living hell out of me because that's all Stu Gatz knows how to do is spin content and immediately just erupt takes everywhere. And I know he's not going to judge me for not changing my clothes ever because he's also not going to change his clothes ever musician i'm gonna go darius rucker on this one darius rucker friend of the family all-time soothing voice i don't condone many of these internet challenges because they involve physical activity but he did a deep cuts internet challenge and it just reminded me that anything he sings turns to gold so i have lullabies there i have great sing-alongs again with Stu Gatz's alcohol involved and then finally the capper on all this gardner Minshew, like the guy that <laughs> His own uh, RV that he took across America. What better way to quarantine than with a guy who's got literally a mobile home that we can social distance in and see the great nation from a safe and comfortable distance. He's a purveyor of jorts everywhere, a mighty mustache, which is the flavor and currency of the coronavirus period here so much. So I've been thinking about a mustache. So all in all, I feel like I got a pretty solid group. Okay, I'm going to pick your group apart for a few reasons here. Number one, Stu Gatz is definitely going to eat all of the food and drink all of the alcohol, but then blame somebody else for it, right? So you're not going to get any of the good good from that. Darius Rucker, I have had the opportunity to spend some time on tour with. I once challenged Darius Rucker to play a little Madden, and you know he had a green room at the time that had an Xbox and a PlayStation side by side, and he'd play in either of them. But let me just tell you, my friend, the buy-in to play Darius Rucker in Madden is well past either of our pay grades. So Darius Rucker is going to take your money. Like, you're going to end up with no cash by the end of it because Darius Rucker is going to find a way to bet you on everything that's out there, and he's going to outdo you on it. And Gardner Minshew can have better facial hair than you do. So you lost on all three. I mean, it's a fun group, Mike, but you don't come out of that quarantine better, my friend. So you keep thinking that people are going to take my money or that things are going to get taken from me. Stu Gotts is the ultimate looter. Like you just send him to the house next door and he's coming back with whatever they've got in this situation. I don't have to worry about Darius taking my money because Stu Gotts is going to be too busy trying to take his money. Like I have brought the ultimate, you talk about having someone to run your mouth in front of so that they'll take all the blow. Stu Gotts is going to handle all this for me. He's going to have Gardner Minshew coming on his radio show every day. It's going to get all figured out here. So he's the secret sauce, but make no mistake, 
the power players in here are all ready to play their part. Well, and you're right. Like Stu Gatz will just walk into somebody's house while they're not expecting it, take the food out of their kitchen. They'd be like, what? <laughs> and they'll walk out with it. So, yeah, there is a strength to your house. I, I'll give you credit for that. All right. So stop criticizing and start showing me who you're doing this with. Okay, so there's logic to my, my mindset. I'm going to start with my ESPN personality. I'm going Bobby Carpenter. Why am I going Bobby Carpenter? Because look at these videos of Bobby Carpenter working out, and he's like the nicest guy in the world. So I'm going to go to Bobby and be like, hey, Bobby, train me and give me the right nutrition every single day. Bobby will do that for free. So I'm going to come out of this quarantine looking like a damn supermodel. That's going to happen 100%. So Bobby Carpenter, easy, my ESPN personality part of it. From musician, I'm going to go with Richie Sambora. My first concert was Bon Jovi. I remember being a little kid. I was on my dad's shoulders in Scarborough, Maine. I thought my dad was passing a lot of cigarettes back and forth. Took me a lot of years to realize it wasn't cigarettes. But I did watch Richie Sambora explode up on the stage in what I now know is called a toaster. He jumps up from out of nowhere. Smoke explodes everywhere. I'm this little classical violinist. And I was like, that is cooler than what I do. So Richie Sambora inspired everything that I eventually did as a touring musician. I just want to be able to be like Chris Farley doing the bad interviews with Richie Sambora every single day. So that one's easy. For athlete, I'm going personality, dude. Peyton Manning. I want an athlete that's going to make me laugh. I want an athlete that I'm going to be able to have fun with. I'm going to, well, I want an athlete that's going to suddenly do crazy, funny things. I want an athlete that's going to bring personality and make the whole room laugh. And all you have to do to remember how much Peyton can make you laugh is remember Peyton and Ron Burgundy, which we have right here for the world. No, we don't. I thought we did. Except we did. Now we don't. See? But Peyton will save me in that setup. So I got Bobby Carpenter, Richie Sambora, Peyton Manning. Peyton Manning already letting you down. You see how that goes? Because you assume that the Peyton Manning in the commercial is there 24-7. What you forget, and I understand you fancy yourself a pretty meticulous guy. You're a neat freak. You like everything well organized. You think you're organized, and then you're going to meet Peyton Manning. Like, I talked to whiteouts who used to play for Peyton Manning, and it is beyond meticulous. It is so down to the fine-tooth comb of all the details that guys, like, after a while burnt out pretty quickly. So you're going to be living under a very strict regime there. I hope you know that. Like, this isn't all fun and games. It's not all cut that meat. It's not all commercials. You're about to, you're about to find out how it really goes. So I'm going to have jam sessions with Richie Sambora. I'm going to have workouts every day with Bobby Carpenter. And then I'm going to get more organized, learn more about football, get more meticulous, and get funnier just by hanging out with Peyton Manning. I come out of this thing going from, let's say, right now, an 8 on a scale of 1 to 10, straight up to a 10. It's a really generous 8 right there. That being said... <laughs> And like an easy way to bring your number down is to just stand next to Bobby Carpenter for too long. Was he working out in his underwear in there too? Or are we just going to let that fly that Bobby was in there in briefs, just getting after it, going for the power lunges right here. Like those aren't shorts. I don't care about, and you know what? I'm for it. Like the male tight res revolution has taken far too long to catch up to our female counterparts. Rise up Kings and take the workout apparel you so rightly deserve. Look, I don't want to ever see you in the tightest of tights working out, Mike. Let's just be like clear about that. You, If you're going to lunge, I want you in big comfy. Like you barely wear dress pants anyway, but if you could try and wear like some sort of version of sweats while you do that, America would be grateful. I'm just I'm saying. Going shorter and tighter. I have lime green Lulu tights upstairs in my dresser. These things leave so little to the imagination. They're illegal in most counties in Connecticut. So that can we can we just acknowledge this? This is this is one of the hills I frequently die on about you know Michael Luke Jr. and Jason Fitz. If you took the things that come out of your mouth. And you put them out of my mouth instead. If I was talking to you about my tighter than tight tighties that I'm doing my workouts in that are lime green, you would be all over mockery. You do it. And suddenly it's just a former fat guy that's getting himself in shape and we're crediting it. I don't understand it. Listen, I wish I could say like that in real time, five minutes before that this broadcast happened, that one of my good friends didn't post a video of me giving his wife a lap dance at their wedding reception. But it happened because that's how I live my life. And so once you've set that as the standard and the bar, all of this becomes on brand. And you're right. It is funnier because I'm bigger. I didn't lift weights and get tattoos to be good at football. I got it so I could do whatever I wanted without ever being criticized for it.
Again, you have the, you and I both have tattoos. Mine are oh, that's so cute, and yours are like oh, that's scary. I I, I don't get it. I don't get it. Uh, we will let you guys though chime in, uh, tweet us at mgolikjr five seven at Jason Fitz. Who would you be quarantined with? I, I'm interested to see your comment on the video. I'm interested to see uh, who everybody else would build their quarantines with. Uh, in the meantime, let's get to some sports because today, my friend, is a very significant day in my life. Today is the anniversary of something I don't get to say very much, which is championships for the teams that I root for. When I was a little kid, I have one videotape in my entire house. For everything that I've done in my my life, I have one videotape from my childhood. And it says on it, UNLV 103, Duke 73. That's all it says on it. Today is the anniversary of the Running Rebels whooping that butt of Duke 103, 73. It is a day that I celebrate, but particularly being the uh, 30th anniversary of it, it feels like a special day in my fandom. Larry Johnson, Stacey Augman, uh, Greg Anthony. Stacey Augman, though, I was such a massive Stacey Augman fan. A few years ago, we were out on tour. We were at Boise, and UNLV was playing Boise State. So I go into the game. Like, I buy a ticket, and I'm like, I'm going to spend my night off going to this Boise State-UNLV game. That year, Stacey Augman was a bench coach for UNLV. I sat, like, two rows behind him, and I spent the entire game like fan-childing Stacey Augman, trying to figure out if, was, if I should walk up and say hi. And then I saw him walk off, and I didn't have the guts to do it. Still regret it to this day. You're like one of, I would imagine, 10 people that sees this through the lens of UNLV anymore. Like, the world's so obsessed with Duke hate and the fact that Mike Krzyzewski looks the exact same in that picture as he does now for the most part, which is terrifying. We cannot rule out that he's a vampire. But, yeah, I, that was... The interesting thing is we talked to, because again, the Duke perspective tends to be the more national perspective, Mike Krzyzewski the other day, because it was the anniversary of his first title that came the next year. But like the first thing that he mentioned was getting absolutely bodied by that UNLV team. So in addition to leaving a mark on your heart, it also scarred one of the greatest college basketball coaches of all time for good reason. Because like those Dukes team back then, it was four final fours in five years and getting bodied like that by a team like UNLV will stick with you when outside of capping it with a championship at that point, you're talking about one of the more dominant runs of a college basketball team you will ever see. Look, I remember where I was in 1991. I remember the exact place I was sitting when Duke upset UNLV in the final four. It made me cry. It made me cry all night long, Mike. I still hate Duke to this day. I don't even try and hide it. Like, I am anti-Duke. I'm anti-Coach K. Like, Jay Will walks up and down the halls at ESPN. I kind of want to trip him just because he played for Duke. Look, I have no love for Duke because they upset UNLV on an undefeated season in 91. It was a better team in 91. It was a team that was destined to go down in history. And instead, not only do they lose that game, but right after that, some controversial pictures come out of some of their stars sitting in a hot tub of a known mafia guy. And before you know it, UNLV's under death penalty. Jerry Tarkany is not the coach anymore. And the entire program falls apart thanks to Duke and Coach K. I'm still angry. I'm not going to lie. After hearing that hot tub part, I kind of like this team a lot more. I need to <laughs> go back and look more about it. It sounds like my kind of party. Look, the funny thing to me is that, you know, Vegas and the Golden Knights became a real sensation when they, uh, when they went to the stand on their Stanley Cup run a couple of years ago when they became part of the NHL. And people were stunned that Vegas was a sports town. And that's funny to me as a kid. And even when you look forward to the Raiders coming this fall, when I was a kid, UNLV was it. It was a, a destination. Thomas and Mack Center was an impossible ticket to get. All of the celebrities, all of the stereotypical celebrities of that era of the Wayne Newtons and the Siegfried Roys and all those guys, like they went and they would dress like Vegas shut down for UNLV games. It was a sports town there with all the glitz and glamour of that period. All they ever need is for a team to be good. And that city flocks around it. That's why I'm not surprised to see the Golden Knights have success. And it's why, frankly, if, if the Raiders come in and have any level of success out of the gate, I think people are going to be stunned by the star power, the celebrity power that comes into it, but also the way the city of Las Vegas supports sports. Las Vegas is more of a sports town than people realize. You know how this is going to end up, right? Like, all of that's going to happen. Things are going to start going well. And then a couple of nice seasons at Iona are going to turn to Rick Pitino at UNLV. And we're going to restart the whole cycle of impropriety all over again. Hey, if that's what it takes to be great, look, everybody always says, would you trade one or two championships if it means you're going to be irrelevant for a decade? That's always the question that everybody asks. Look, as a Raiders fan, a UNLV fan, like I haven't watched good teams in a very long time from my fandom. Yeah, you give me a championship run, a Super Bowl run, and then tell me that it's just going to be a whole bunch of suck after that for a while, I'm in. 
it's not it's not the suck you have to worry about it's the cha- championships being taken away like you don't get to keep them when papa rick comes to town no you get to keep the memory though come on mike you know about vacated wins it doesn't matter for players it doesn't matter for fans nobody can take the sports illustrated swag that i would buy like by the box full that all says champion or super bowl like you cheat all day long just get me a championship that i can celebrate i don't care Nobody can take that memory away. The NCAA can come and pry those wins from my cold, dead, lifeless fingers if they want to try to. My kung fu grip is never letting go of those 12 wins. They can vacate that championship game. They can they can take that one with them, box it up, and throw it in the ocean. You know what, Mike? You went out there and you did your best. And that's what matters, my friend. You kidding. did your I was I tried. Look, I tried to build you up. Speaking of championship games. This is also a, a significant anniversary. The 2006 Rose Bowl oh. uh, not in, uh, was 30 years ago. Um, it, I don't know. No, it wasn't 30 years ago. 2006, I can't do math. 2006 oh. Rose Bowl is airing on ESPN tonight. I thought there was an anniversary around it, and then I realized I just can't read. So uh, the, the anniversary, th- that game being played tonight. Like when you asked me how old you were. You yeah, asked Matt me is- how old you were, and you asked me how long you had been married to your wife. Do we have to do something? Like, I know you said, like, I found out today that Jason Fitz doesn't know how to ride a bike. Do we need to go back to, like, addition and subtraction, too? Look, it's difficult. Like, I was born in 77, so, you know, sometimes I got to do math. And then I'm like, does that mean I'm 42 or am I 43? Like, I don't know. I'm 42. I'm almost 43. Mike, don't make me do math. It's hard, okay? Not all of us were Notre Dame All-Americans, all right? Like, we're always reminded that you were an academic All-American, Mr. Math Guy. So, you know, there you go. Basic math skills. We're always reminded of that because I can't tell you that I was a real (laughs) All-American. Well, the 2006 Rose Bowl is going to replay tonight. And while we're on the theme of 30 years because of UNLV, there's my 30-year tie-in. Uh, that we all remember that this was let's let's just agree right this is the, the best college football game in the last 30 years right uh, it, Jason it was the most exciting game I've ever watched thunder and lightning for USC you see Lundell like that's the thing is I always tell people Reggie Bush is the best college football player I've ever seen with my own two eyes like my that is the foundation of my youth we did our top five quarterbacks of all time the other day and it was so weird to me that the USC quarterback room was not represented there because these early 2000s USC teams were so foundational in my football development, but Reggie Bush, Lendell White, Matt Leinart, and these teams going up against one of the greatest performances we've ever seen from Vince Young in that Texas squad. That, that run right there and the ensuing confetti are etched into my soul forever. Well, and, and that run meant so much that it even skewed our conversation about the best college football quarterbacks of all time. I mean, you, you look at what that mattered. And part of speaking of skewed conversations that we have to remember is the, the context has been lost a little bit. Lindell White, Matt Leiner, you're talking about some guys that had some heavy expectations coming out of college that didn't necessarily meet up to those. So sometimes we let their pro careers or their lack thereof to the right level affect the way we look back at the talent in that game. And I, I don't think you can do that in this instance. You have to remember how special what we were watching was and how dynamic the playmakers were. And that's part of what made it really incredible. You were watching playmakers thrive and it wasn't a game defined by mistakes. It was a game defined by, frankly, the ability of athletes to make other athletes look small in huge moments. I mean, that's what's huge to me when I look back at it is just the athleticism we saw. Well, and a game defined by questionable decision-making by Pete Carroll, if I remember rightly, because there were some plays where Lendell White and Reggie Bush were not on the field at times that you would have expected them to be at the end of that game. But on the other side, it was Vince Young staring across the sideline at Heisman trophies that he thought should have been his, right? Like Vince Young is one of those names we talk about as the greatest players to never win a Heisman trophy. And Reggie Bush and Matt Leinan on the other side are sitting there with a full hardware cabinet. At that point, NCAA, give Reggie back his Heisman. It's his. We all know it's his. No amount of houses or cars or any other impropriety is going to change that. He did those things. I watched that Fresno State game. You will never take that from me. If uh, if he wanted to go out and just get a replica Heisman trophy, I'd be good with that. Like, I'm not usually a big fan of replica awards, but, like, they take it back. I just go somewhere, and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to pay the coin, just get a company to make me one that looks exactly like it and throw it on my mantle because we all know that he deserved it. But this does have us at least having a little bit of conversation, not just about the Rose Bowl, but about some other great games as we take a look back at the last 30, uh, 30 years, some of the best college football games that we've seen of all time. Now, ESPN did a listing of these, and we've, we've you know, at least taken a, a look at a few of them that stand out. And I want to start with one that is known for the upset because this becomes every year, Mike, part of the conversation that we have. App State 
Michigan. We all remember Appalachian State wins 34-32 over Michigan. And it was this play that actually just defined it all. You, you got the block kick. Everybody thought that this couldn't happen. The call on it's one of the most famous calls. You hear it every single year. And this becomes the rallying cry for every small school. When you say, why play these games? There's always the, well, we could upstate them. It's become its own sort of logic and phrase. Well, and like, lest we not forget that that kind of put App State on the map for a lot of people. Like App State's become one of those teams that no one really wants to see. For the last couple of years, it's been home to some damn good coaches that have gone on to other Power 5 jobs in a lot of this. But there are a few things in life that make me as happy as a bunch of sad people in the stands wearing maize. Like this is one that we remember very, very fondly in South Bend. No, oh, that's a, I, I can only imagine. Like that's the best part about college football. The only thing – uh, that almost matches your favorite team winning in college f- football is watching your least favorite team lose. Like that's, that's the dynamic of college football fans. Okay. That's one that stands out, but there's one particular game on the list of the best ever of the last 30 that stands out because of me and you to me stands out to me. And it's the first championship game that we got to cover together. We were at Mercedes Benz stadium, Alabama taking on Georgia. This is the 2018 championship game. We'd done a live stream before the game where we did everything from eat copious amounts of snacks to break down to a tongue of Aloha. Like it was a, it was a great broadcast, but we were standing, it was my first time standing on the sideline during a national championship game. And everybody remembers uh, that a, a little bit of the epicness of that game. Oh, look, we're so, all right. We've got footage coming here. Yeah. Remember this. And uh, you and I had, had, had the opportunity to do the pregame broadcast to a tongue of Aloha came in at halftime Obviously, uh, you know, all eyes were going to be on that. You had broken it down during the pregame show on why you thought he could come out and be impactful. You you looked brilliant that moment. I did. All thanks to Tom Rinaldi. I was talking to him before the game, and he had been one helping cover Alabama. And we had heard all year they had been really impressed by what they had seen behind the scenes from Tua. And then he takes that sack in overtime, and immediately the next play gets the safety to bite with his eyes and throws an absolute dart for the game-winning touchdown right there. And I remember we were standing on the field right after that play, and this is when panic and, and terror took over for you. Well, yeah, because I didn't realize we were standing on the sideline directly in front of the confetti cannons. I had no idea. So the minute that play happens, all of a sudden you hear this explosion from behind us and confetti's just falling everywhere. And I remember just jumping out of my seat. You're laughing at me. I'm standing next to you as confetti's just falling down all over us, realizing I've learned the lesson. We've had the opportunity now to cover three straight national championship games. I find that damn cannon every year and make sure I'm not anywhere close to it at the end of the game. Yeah, you and me have the same motivation of staying far away from that cannon because I have a real phobia of loser confetti. That was the, <laughs> I'm telling you, no one prepares you for that moment. And, like, you learned. That's why I was surprised, Jason, because you worked in show business for a long time. You're used to a lot of moving parts. The one thing you remember is all the wheels start to turn while the game is still going on, and you see these things all happening. And you got to feel where it is because the last place you want to be after you lose a national championship in front of your friends and loved ones and an entire nation of people watching is they're being co- coated in the other team's colored confetti while you try and exchange a little bit of dap before you leave the field. I have literally, since 2013 when I lost the national title, I have never once until this past season stayed on the field for a trophy presentation for a team because all I can think about while everyone else is watching the winners is there is a team full of kids that got as close as they could and now they're covered in loser confetti. You know, that's, uh, I, I sympathize with that. Like, honestly, you know, I remember when I first moved to Nashville and I was trying to get to some level of status in the music business and things were so difficult in the beginning. And, you know, I had friends that were, were starting to have a lot of success. And so you'd watch like the American Music Awards, or the Billboard Awards, and you watch your friends starting to win all these awards. And it was really difficult. Like you want to be like you want to watch, you want to support because, you know, it's like I love watching that stuff and I'm in that industry and I want to support my friends. But watching them get these awards while you're sitting at home is just a kick in the no-no places that I think is hard to sort of figure out a way to, to manage or wrap your mind around. So I can't imagine having stood through loser confetti to again then have to stand through loser confetti or winner confetti either way. Yeah, well, that's why I was glad to find out that I had a soul at this year's college football national championship because Joe Burrow and Ed O and LSU win in front of a home crowd there at the Superdome in New Orleans. And I, I found myself, I was walking towards the exit and I was like, 
I'll stay and watch these guys. Like, this is a pretty special run. And so I did found out I do have a heart in there, even though you're like, the more I think about it, because when we talk about other games that are the most memorable of all time, there is one that is super memorable to me, but burns me for two reasons. And it's the Notre Dame USC Bush push game. Also back in 2005, because remember that game was Notre Dame had grown out the grass all leading up to that one. It's Brady Quinn's Irish, the handsomest quarterback in college football history. And I will never forget <laughs> who was supposed to be at this game. My football team in high school was supposed to be playing on Friday night, but because of such inclement weather, we ended up having to move the game until Saturday morning. And so because of that, I ended up having to stick around and stay in uh, in Connecticut for the night to play that game. And so a couple of my buddies ended up going to that one. I said, oh, you know what? I go to a lot of Notre Dame, Dame games. This won't be that bad. Ends up going down as an immediate classic, an overnight game that showed up the next day on ESPN Classic getting played as Dwayne Jarrett catches a fourth and eight, an impossible fourth and eight on that one to spring for a long run that brings USC down into scoring range. Then USC fumbles it out of bounds. They kick the thing right out of there and seven seconds tick off the clock and South Bend is going absolutely bonkers. And then they put it all back on there. And then obviously the Bush push itself happens. And I'll never forget calling my buddy after that game. And he said, it's the quietest sporting event and the quietest venue I have ever heard in my life. Said you could hear a mouse fart in that stadium after they put that time back on that clock. And he shoved that man illegally at the time, illegally at the time into the end zone. So not only was I supposed to be at one, I, what I think is one of the five best college football games ever played, but my team also lost in impossibly gross fashion. Like as bad as the Bush push was, I still look at fourth and eight, fourth and eight. And they put an absolute dime on a covered Dwayne Jarrett. Look, I, uh, I rarely ask the team behind the scenes. And we have a great one here with Kenny and Haley. Uh, that help make the show possible. I rarely ask for these things to be clipped off. I need this clipped off for me because every time I bring up the tuck rule and speak with such passion, Junior makes fun of me. I've now seen, I've seen the tuck rule trigger. I will now, I'm going to just internalize this. I'm going to keep it inside and I will bring this back to you the next time you're giving me grief about the fact that there's no such thing as a tuck. You know what, but like, that's the thing is I'm not even that mad about the bush push part of it. Like I put it on the offensive side of the ball. I enjoy doing whatever it takes to get to the end zone. It's really the fourth and eight that bothers me. Like he was covered. He was covered, and it's an unbelievable one-handed catch. Like, USC went through this phase in the early 2000s where it was just this endless string of receivers wearing a single-digit number who ended up being tight end level thick when they got to the NFL, but who caught everything in the red zone in college. And Dwayne Jarrett happened to be the one that did us the most dirty in that time period. Man, that is – this is I, – if I could give you a hug, what did we learn from Donnie Wahlberg? Twugs? Like, I, I'm giving you a Twitter hug right now. There, there we go. Giving you a, a Twitter hug, Mike. I feel your pain happening right now we'll, we'll end today's uh, episode as we do every single day with some quick fits let's see if we can bring some joy back to mike we'll get him we'll get him a little bit unspun here and nothing brings joy more than watching our friends get tremendous recognition now mina kimes is a close friend to both of us and somebody that uh we both uh, we both work with a lot and we love and she's fantastic and she also shares our passion for dogs i'll admit i've never been more jealous of Mina Kimes than I was on Twitter when I saw Joe Buck and we all see that uh, you get you get all right, uh, our friend Joe Mina Buck Kimes doing has his sent thing in a video. he's he's giving us play by play on different plays he chose a Mina video to give us play by play on I feel all right our I friend Mina Kimes has sent in a video this. okay yes. here we go let's go Buck, 17 like of seconds of right unadulterated have a lot to commentate on and so he was submitting videos and this video of Lenny Mina's co-host on the Mina Kimes show featuring Lenny a podcast who was referred to by Joe Buck in this video as Scraps the Dog. And now Joe Buck has since come back and apologized and created his nickname, but Lenny has a given name. And you see right here, Lenny, an athlete, again, three-syllable athlete, moving on this play. Lenny is not Scraps. Lenny is not some wide receiver with a skin tone that we deem sneaky athletic in this situation. Lenny is out here doing things. Look, now I know Lenny and I have something in, in common together. Not only uh, not only do we both uh, know Mina Kimes, but Joe Buck doesn't know either of our names. So there we go. Me and Lenny have something in common. All right. Uh, by the way, Joe, feel free. Like, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm trying, man. Like, do one of my dogs. Come on. That's all I'm asking for, Mike. That's all I'm asking for. All right. Next up, you and I have talked a little bit about working out. We've talked a little bit about sort of what we can do to stay in shape. Well, We've got some uh, interesting, uh, some interesting workouts happening on the 
tennis side of things, and it involves household items. Like you, you had uh, you had weights brought to the house. What if I told you that you could be practicing at home your tennis stroke oh, wow. with frying pans? Look at this, Joker practicing with frying pans. See, this I always wondered how the tennis players end up with like one forearm that is way bigger than the other one, like so ah, uncomfortably bigger wow, than the other one. Yeah. Now I realize if you're at home training with kitchen appliances like this, oh my god, oh. Oh, well, of course, like, again, like, Roger Federer is also of the super rich. Like, tennis players have different kind of money because when you look at what tennis players advertise, like, he's doing Rolex ads. Like, you're not uh, yeah. normal people or even normal athletes doing Rolex ads. You know what Rolex buys you? A ping pong table the size of your backyard. Look, I, I think the important thing here is that we've now seen an in-home tennis video that you and your brother Jake should replicate at your mom and dad's house. Just because I wanna see Chris and Senior react to the two of you trying to play tennis over the fine furniture in the middle of the house. That's what I'm looking for. We broke enough in that house for a long time. <laughs> we have retired breaking stuff at my mom's house because now instead of being on their payroll, we're on separate payroll, which means when we break stuff, we gotta buy stuff. And uh, I'm not in that market right now. We are going to give a bonus quick fits. We've talked earlier in the episode about the things that Mike can do and get away with that I never could. He opened the can of worms. This is like being on Law and Order. When you're on the stand and you mention it, oh, no. we're gonna get it, we're gonna bring it back at you. Apparently, our crack team here that does great work has already decided to find the video of Golik lap dancing at the wedding. Let's see it, America. Oh yeah. It's Wow. You can't hear it in the audio, but the song Pony is playing in the background. I do a mean chair dance to Genuine's Pony right there. That is Hillary, Chris, Hillary Ferguson, then now Hillary Christ, the wife of my former teammate and college football quarterback at Notre Dame, Dane Christ. And yeah, I give out lap dances as wedding presents. That's kind of the unspoken, like, you don't have to ask. You just throw on Pony, and I start doing that. Like, my body only knows one language, and that is the language of physical body role filled love look i have never in my life wanted a vow renewal more and I, it'll happen and i'll play pony but i'm gonna be in the chair just you know it's me in the chair let's go america listen jason that's fine but i'm just gonna tell you if you want to get on the tracks when the train's coming through you do that at your own risk like you saw what's in that video so don't complain when you get exactly the trouble that you went looking for Suddenly, social distance, distancing has never sounded better. He's Mike Golick Jr. I'm Jason Fitz. Come back to us every single day, Monday through Friday. We're here from 3.30-ish to 4-ish, and you never know what you're going to get from that guy. Thanks for hanging out with us. Come back tomorrow. Good Lord. Mm -hmm.